Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I used to do these anniversary videos for the channel every year where I'd answer a whole bunch of patron questions, and hopefully a bunch of yours as well. I kind of forgot last year, and, well, it's been a while since I've done one of these, so let's do another one. I put out the call for questions, and I got swamped, so I'm going to do my best to get through as many as I can. I tend to ramble in these videos, so I'm going to try to speed run this and get through as many questions as possible. Do you have a favorite YouTuber? I watch a lot of YouTube, as you might guess. I have a whole bunch of channels that I subscribe to regularly. Of course, I like all of the big machining channels. You know, I watch Adam Booth. I watch uh, Curtis over at CEE. Uh, I watch Keith Appleton. Uh, gosh, I don't even want to name them because I'm going to miss people that I love. Uh, I also love uh, the heavy equipment channels. There's a guy called Pacific Northwest Hillbilly who's rebuilding an excavator. I watch him. Uh, there's this awesome Estonian guy called Ants Pants who's constantly building stuff on his uh, family farm. Uh, I watch that guy. So it, just kind of all over the place. Uh, a lot of equipment, heavy equipment, machining, um, all sorts of things. The A3 switcher is going to be rideable, right? How much will it be able to carry? And can I get tickets to ride it now? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, it will be rideable. Uh, well, you ride behind it with three and a half inch gauge because the locomotive itself is too small to actually sit on. So you sit on a, a riding or a driving car that's behind the locomotive. But uh, yeah, at our club here, I've seen three and a half inch gauge locomotives similar in size to mine pulling, you know, seven or eight adults and a bunch of kids. Like they can pull a lot. So that will definitely be happening. And of course, I'll be bringing you along for the ride here on video. In a previous Q&A, you said you had built or rebuilt several cars. Do you design and fabricate parts for those cars? Uh, I was never a parts designer or fabricator. I was just rebuilding cars. Uh, my first car was a 1974 Jeep CJ5 that I did a full frame-off restoration on, every nut and bolt, pulled that whole thing apart, put it all back together again. Uh, and then I've had various other sports cars and things over the years that I've tinkered with. Um, and then, of course, uh, I was... Uh, a racer for a little while. I did uh, 24 hours of lemons for 10 years. And so uh, me and a bunch of my idiot friends uh, were always building and rebuilding uh, the two race cars that we had. So uh, that, that kind of thing. Uh, as far as like manufacturing and fabricating and designing parts, one of my favorite YouTubers, back to that question, is Super Fast Matt. That guy is so funny. His content is great. And uh, he does all kinds of different auto, automotive and motorsport kinds of things. So go watch him. Do you have any stories from your childhood that we might find interesting? No. Perhaps something that helped you choose your career path and what led you to making instructional videos? Maybe. In short, what life events probably steered you toward the path you have taken? Well, I always remember something that my mom told me when I was young. She said that my generation will have multiple careers in our lifetime compared to her generation and previous generations that just had one. And at the time I thought that sounded silly, but she was right. I'm on career number three or four now at this point. I was uh, an IT professional for many, many years, and then I was a console game developer for many years, then I was a mobile developer for many years. Uh, I freelanced for many years, and now I'm apparently a YouTuber. So I think the moral of the story is always be keeping your options open and just always be looking for that intersection of your interests things that you enjoy doing and things that will make money. I think all of us have different places in our lives where those two things overlap. And if you can manage to find one or two or three of those things, you're going to be happy. Kind of related, this YouTube thing has been your full-time job for a while. How do you feel about it? I mean, it's great. Uh, I'm really, really enjoying it. It's uh, obviously it's a lot of work, uh, especially keeping to a weekly uh, video schedule is no small feat. Uh, that's also why you get occasional videos like this one where the quality is not so great and I'm kind of knocking it out in a hurry because sometimes it's either this or you don't get a video at all and uh, I do try to keep that schedule going. So uh, yeah, it's definitely a full-time job, no question about that. And I am still a one-woman show. I don't have an editor or a camera person or anything like that. So uh, keeping my overhead low though uh, by just doing it by myself is what makes this work financially for me. So uh, I hope that uh, the content works for you. I do try to keep the quality level as high as I can, and I'm always trying to push the quality level up as best I can. I'm not a professional photographer or videographer or editor, so there's a lot about all those disciplines that I don't know, of course, but I'm 
trying to get better as we go here. Are you working on any projects other than model engineering at the moment? How is Johnny? Yeah, I'm always working on 10 different things. Uh, the model engineering stuff is every, every other video on my YouTube channel, as you know, but I'm also always working on educational content and tool making projects and so on. Uh, outside of the machine shop, I am always working on Johnny. There's always something wrong with him. Uh, I'm also still an avid uh, retro computer enthusiast. Uh, I've got an Apple 2C Plus, I've got an Apple 2C, uh, sorry, I've got a 2C Plus, a 2 Plus, an Apple 2GS, and a Commodore 64. Uh, the 2GS is down right now with a bad, I believe, a bad power supply, so I'm working on rebuilding that. Uh, I also co-host uh, a retro computing podcast called the Retro Computing Roundtable. Uh, so if you're interested in that, go, go check out that podcast. And uh, I'm getting into gardening this year, so I'm going to be building a raised bed uh, in my front yard where the sun is. Uh, so, you know, I'm always working on different stuff. Do you have any recommendations for someone trying to practice a hobby while holding down a full-time job? I struggle to have the energy at the end of the day and weekends are spent performing necessary maintenance and recovering from the week. Yeah, that is definitely a challenge, uh, especially if you have a job that you maybe you don't love and it, uh, it, you know it's pushing you really hard. The first three years, two first two years of this YouTube channel, I still had my day job and I was working 60 hour weeks and it was an extremely demanding job. They expected me to be there 100% every day, all day. And that took a lot out of me for sure. And it was difficult to keep the YouTube channel going and building the channel during that time. Uh, I think the short answer is just do what you can. You know, don't push yourself too hard uh, unless you have a goal. Like I had a goal of building this YouTube channel into my next career as it were. So I was willing to push myself pretty darn hard because I knew it was temporary. I was only going to be doing it for a couple of years because I was basically doing two full-time jobs during that period. But even if you can spend an hour or spend 20 minutes even uh, on your hobbies, every little bit helps just to keep yourself in it. I think that's the risk is if you stop working on one of your hobbies for a couple of weeks or a month, it's very, very difficult to get back to it. But if you just spend 20 minutes here or there on it, make it part of your routine, allocate a little piece of your day and force yourself to do it. Even if you're tired, the payoff is there. Is there a piece of knowledge you wish you had heard sooner or skill you wish you had prioritized mastering sooner? Uh, I think probably patience. I think that's something that nobody really talks about in the machine shop uh, world, especially on YouTube. You know, YouTube machining is very much about editing and time-lapse footage and sped it up footage to try and make it more exciting because in the real world, machining is slow. It, 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 it takes time. You spend a lot of time tearing down and setting up strap clamps and you spend a lot of time standing there watching the cutter moving across the part like this and that's just not good video, right? So people edit around that and they make it exciting in the videos. The problem with that is if you're learning machining or if your only exposure to machining is through YouTube, you have a very warped uh, impression of how fast it is. And the more patient you are, the higher quality work you will produce. And that's true of everything, whether you're a model railroader or a software engineer or whatever you do, the more patient you are, the more willing you are to stop and think and redo things uh, and take the time to do things properly and not rush, the better your work is going to be. So uh, patience really pays off in machine shop work more than any endeavor that I've ever seen, frankly. So patience. What tool is next on your want buy list? Any plans or wants on ever moving out of the garage to a bigger shop? Uh, well, I did just move to a bigger shop in a new country. Uh, thank you very much. That was quite a lot of work. So no, I don't plan to do that again. I mean, my new shop is, it's still a one, one car garage effectively, but it's about 30 or 40% bigger than my last one is, was, which is a big deal. Uh, do I plan to, I mean, to move to an even bigger shop uh, than that, I would have to have a separate building, uh, which would require moving somewhere else, I guess. Um, that's not something that's ever really interested me. Uh, I like having a small shop. I like having the shop attached to my living space because it's always there. It's super easy for me to go out and spend 10 minutes tinkering with something. I don't have to drive to some other building and I don't have to live in some, you know, area where I can have a separate building which has its own life costs and, you know, lifestyle choices that go with that. So uh, I like the small shop. Uh, I like being able to 
access all of my machinery within a couple of steps. You're not spending all day walking back and forth across a giant shop to different giant machinery. You know, that's not the kind of work that, that I want to do. And so I probably will probably stay where I am, at least for the foreseeable future. How many pieces of rolling stock do you plan to build for your A3? Does the club share some pieces for a sizable consist? Oh yeah, uh, the club has lots and lots of rolling stock. Uh, some really nice stuff, all different scales. Mainly, I think what people do with the locomotives at this club is pull the public around. So we have public run days where, uh, you know, the club members bring out their locomotives and they have a, a series of riding cars and, uh, you know, the kids especially uh, en enjoy it. So everybody gets on the cars and they get pulled around the track for a couple of laps. So that's the main thing I think that uh, I hope to do with mine. The, uh, as, as for building rolling stock myself, I'll probably build one riding car mainly for myself. I think I have room in my backyard to build a small loop uh, just for testing. So I'll need a riding car for that so I can sit behind it and test drive it uh, because the club is pretty far from me, frankly. It's a long drive, so I won't be able to get out there as much as I would like to, uh, to drive it on the club track. So that's my plan. Have you kept up with your retro computing hobby? I have. I mentioned my array of retro computers that I still have. And in fact, I've been working on, for the last several years, I've been working on a game, a new game for the Apple IIGS. Uh, that's actually nearing completion as I record this. So uh, I'll put a link to that in the, in the description below if you're interested. It's nothing fancy. It's just something that I wanted to build for myself to learn the techniques on that particular platform. Uh, but yep, I'm absolutely still going in that hobby. Any good Discord groups for newbie home machinists? Uh, I haven't seen a lot of machining content on Discord. I don't know that it isn't there. The hobby machinists seem to mostly prefer the old web forum format. So there's the model engine maker forums and the home shop machinist forums. So if you Google home machinist forums, you'll find five or six different ones. And they're the old style of web forum uh, that looks vaguely like a BBS from the late 90s that said that interfaces are not as nice as something like something more modern like Discord or Slack. Uh, but, uh, but they are there, the discussions are there, they're active, and uh, you know, there are great communities for, for support for, for this type of work. I would like to hear the story of how Sprocket chose you to be her human. Uh, well, <laughs> she's still around, so I guess I did something right. Uh, yes. Yeah, Rocket came from a city animal shelter uh, in California, and I just decided I wanted a cat in my life, and I went to the shelter, and I you know, played with all the cats. They have a little room where you can meet all the cats, and uh, I don't know, she just looked at me, and uh, I, knew, I knew that was it. Uh, she just really seemed to want to come home with me, and, uh, you know, I guess you just, you, when you know, you know, right? How do you decide when to use carbide and when to use high-speed steel in the tangential tool holder? Yeah, if you've been watching my channel for a long time, you know that I used to use more mostly traditional high-speed steel tooling. These days, I'm pretty much only using the tangential holder or uh, a little bit of carbide. I use the carbide mostly in steel because it just it's easier to get a good finish with the carbide and or if I'm doing heavy cuts because the carbide handles that better. And then I use the tangential if, uh, for most other things, frankly, or especially if I'm going to be doing facing and turning and or turning a lot, bunch of shoulders, the tangential is really nice because you can do facing and turning without having to change the tool post angle. So it's really nice for that. Uh, I also have now a left hand and right hand version of that one carbide tool that I use uh, so that I can put the left hand version on the back of the tool post for facing, again, to not have to move the tool post angle. I try to never touch my tool post angle these days. I find I gain a lot of efficiency if I can leave it square. So uh, those are kind of my criteria. I just purchased a Chinese lathe, probably the next size up from yours. Do you have any plan to get a slightly more capable lathe, but still remaining with relatable content? Uh, probably not, for the simple reason that that lathe does everything I've ever asked it to do, frankly. Uh, I, I do probably have space for a slightly larger lathe in there. It would be nice to have a gearhead lathe for the occasional turning of large parts, uh, the torque on a DC powered belt lathe uh, is just not that good at low RPM. But aside from that, probably not. You know, getting a new machine is it's a big project. You got to get rid of the old one somehow, find someone to buy it. You got to deal with the pallets and the crates and the trucks and lifting it and installing it and leveling it. It's a lot of work. Eh. 
Currently, this is working great. Have you considered building any more stationary boilers? Uh, and then he references the large engine uh, that I built a couple of years ago, which to this day has only ever run on air because I don't have a boiler big enough for it. I do plan to build a boiler for that engine someday. Uh, a couple of years ago, a viewer sent me this amazing piece of copper tubing. Copper tubing this big is extremely, extremely expensive. And so I'm very, very lucky to have this piece that I think should make a boiler big enough for that engine. I do need to double check my local laws though. Uh, there are, every jurisdiction has regulations on how big you can build a boiler without needing to get that boiler certified annually and inspected and potentially without needing to be a certified boiler maker yourself to build it. So double check you know, local laws before you try to build big boilers. Do you have a reference book or poster for speeds and feeds? I think people always want some sort of magic chart for speeds and feeds and there isn't one for the reason that there's just too many variables. Uh, you need to develop the feel for it, but it's not as hard as you might think. Uh, everything that I know about it and that I recommend about it is still in my video on the topic called Speeds and Feeds. It's in my Lathe Skills playlist. In a world without YouTube, what would you do to keep your workshop as a business? Uh, I probably wouldn't, honestly. Uh, it would be a hobby and not a business if it wasn't for YouTube. But there's basically two major options if you want to have your workshop be your business. Either you make things or you are, do job shop work. If you make widgets, uh, you are signing yourself up for, for piecework. It's a grind. You know, you get paid for each thing you make and nothing for each thing that you don't make. And uh, that's illegal in most countries in factory work now for a reason because it is such a, a dehumanizing grind. But uh, some people like to do that and that's okay. Uh, bear in mind that you're now though competing with Chinese factories. so. Whatever widget you invent and decide to manufacture uh, within a very short amount of time, it is going to get copied if it's successful uh, and someone else is going to make it for one one thousandth the cost that you can. So you need to find a way to make it special, uh, make it a premium product uh, with a brand or some other defining property that people are still going to want to buy yours even when China has knocked it off and is selling it for a lot less. The other option is job shop work, which comes with its own challenges, mainly dealing with customers. Uh, customers do not understand the level of detail that you need to make a good part. Uh, they don't understand how much they have to help you to help them to be successful and get the part for that bicycle or that door lock that they need. And the other thing is people don't tend to understand how much job shop work needs to cost in order for it to be a viable business. So that special piece that they need made that they've given you a napkin drawing for you're going to have to charge them $1,000 for that part to make it worth your time to build it. And they're going to be insulted by that number because they think it's going to cost $20 because everything on Amazon costs $20. So, you know, those are the challenges these days for doing job shop work. What would be an example of a small mill capable of milling steel such as 836 or 4140? Well, the answer for this is the same one I always give, which is that any mill can mill any material. It's just how fast it can do it. You can mill 4140 on a sure line. You just might have to take five or 10 thou cuts and it's gonna take you a while. So it's really just about patience and it's about learning how to use the other tools to support the mill. So in my shop these days, I do almost all of my milling work as it were on the bandsaw and then just do finishing cuts on the mill. Get close to your dimensions with the bandsaw and then the mill doesn't have much work to do and it doesn't take very long. That's the secret to life with a small mill. Fastest tool in the machine shop is the bandsaw. How did you learn the videography side of your channel? Well, my mom was a photographer, so she taught me the basics. I will never be half the photographer that she was, but she taught me about f-stops and depth of field and so on. And then I've, you know, I've got some books on the subject that I've read and watched some YouTube videos and so on. And then like anything else, just practice. If you watch my, you know, very early videos on this channel, they are not good. And someday I will look back on this video, hopefully, and uh, be embarrassed at the poor quality of it. We haven't seen or heard Sprocket performing quality assurance in your shop for a while. Is Sprocket allowed in the new shop uh, or does she have a more comfortable place to be while you're filming? Yeah, I try to get her into the videos as much as I can. Uh, so I jokingly call her my shop cat, but she's actually never been in my shop, uh, in any of my shops. She, she, she stays in the house. Uh, the workshop is just too dangerous for a cat. Uh, I know some people do have cats in their shops. I wouldn't personally. Uh, they don't understand about power tools. You know, she would jump up on the mill table while the mill was running and not know uh, that that's not okay to do. Uh, plus there's metal chips all over the floor. She's gonna get metal, you know, splinters in her little feet. I mean, no, uh, so she has, she's never set paw in my shop other than once 
when the shop was brand new before I moved in and the floors were clean, I let her uh, run around in there a little bit just so she could see it. But no, she doesn't actually come into the shop. So when I have her in my videos, I'm filming in the house. I bring something into the house to get her into the shot. What tooling would you suggest I buy with my first mill? Uh, I would say watch my beginner milling series, my mill skills playlist. Watch, watch that playlist and basically just look at all of the things that I'm using and buy all of that. <laughs> That's honestly my suggestion. Uh, you, you know, you're going to have your parallels and your basic milling cutters and a vise, you know, all of the stuff that you see me using in those first few videos uh, is what you're going to need. In the last A3 photo reference, I noticed some strange equipment, long wooden poles. This, is, for, for some reason, the cosmos aligned and everybody suddenly was asking me about polling in that last video. And uh, this, it's a really interesting topic. So there used to be this practice in railroad switching uh, called polling where rather than having to move the switching engine from track to track in the yard, which costs you time, they would put a big like telephone pole between the front of the locomotive and the back of the car on an adjacent track. And then they could push cars on tracks that were on either side of the locomotive, which saved them constantly moving the locomotive from track to track. Uh, this was called polling. And it got so popular that uh, locomotive and car manufacturers actually started putting polling pockets on the machinery. So many models of the A3 did in fact have polling pockets on them. And, and as you can imagine from that description, the practice was incredibly mind-bogglingly dangerous. A lot of people died doing that. A lot of people were maimed doing that. Uh, in the early days of railroading, they did some truly, truly terrifying things. There's so many ways that can go wrong. That pole can shatter, that pole can pop out and spear somebody. Uh, the car that you're pushing has no brakes because it's not connected to anything. Uh, so many ways that can go wrong. Uh, it's banned now on every railroad. They, they don't do it anymore, but uh, uh, yeah, it was a big thing. So that's polling. Uh, there's some good videos on it on YouTube and uh, I think there's some U uh, Wikipedia pages too on the practice if you wanna, if you wanna know more. What process in the workshop do you find strangely enjoyable? I'm gonna to choose to interpret that as unexpectedly enjoyable. Uh, I actually enjoy the repetitive stuff a lot of times. Like if I have to spend six hours filing or if I have to spend an entire day making tiny bolts, uh, I actually kind of like that because it's sort of meditative and you don't have to think very much. Uh, the problem solving and the constant doing math in your head and stuff of the normal machine shop work is fun, obviously, and it's exciting and it's interesting, but it's also exhausting. So sometimes it's really nice to just put on some music and make tiny bolts for six hours. What book would you recommend for a retired engineer that's just learning the lathe? Uh, I actually did an entire video on this because I get asked about books a lot. And I would say go watch my Absolute Beginners playlist. I did a large section in one of those videos uh, all about uh, the books that I recommend for, for the beginner. What are the requisite consumables on a budget? How many cutting oils do I really need? Do I really need four different quarts of oils to start with a lathe? Uh, the requisites, I would say, again, I actually cover this in my uh, Absolute Beginners series, and I also have a series devoted just to uh, fluids and liquids in the machine shop, so uh, you can find that video as well. Uh, but the two most critical ones are whey oil uh, and cutting oil. And you, you can get by with one cutting oil, rapid tap. Rapid tap, regular rapid tap in a pinch works on pretty much everything except aluminum. Uh, for aluminum, I use WD-40. So I guess that's three, but you probably already have WD-40. Uh, some people also recommend IPA, uh, isopropyl alcohol, as a cutting oil in aluminum. Uh, it does work really well for that. The downside to IPA is that it removes Sharpie marks, and I use Sharpie a lot for layout. So not only does it remove Sharpie, but it will spray blue ink all over your shop in the process. So. Uh, I've got blue splatters all over my lathe from when I tried using IPA. So uh, it is a great cutting fluid for aluminum, but uh, it's messy. Do you have any plans for new machines such as a surface grinder? I do get asked about surface grinders a lot. Uh, I have thought about it. I, I, I got really close to buying one at one point uh, because I do like them and it would be fun to own one. Uh, there are no small ones though. They're, they are all big is part of the problem and I, I do have a small shop. And the fact is, I just wouldn't use it enough to justify the amount of space that it takes up. Uh, some people like to collect tools and just play with the tools for their own sake. Uh, and that's great if that's you. Uh, it's not me. Uh, for me, every tool has to justify its existence because the tools for me are a means to an end. I want to build stuff. I want to have cool stuff that I've made. 
so I don't have any tool that doesn't get used a, a lot. Uh, if, if a tool isn't extremely useful uh, on an almost daily basis, then it gets punted to the curb for something else. Uh, what is a capability that's lacking in your shop that you wish you had? Uh, that's a that's a good question. I would say, me yeah, metal finishing is something that I'd really like to get better at. Uh, one of my favorite YouTubers is Mark Presling, uh, Prezzo, and uh, he's got a whole series of, uh, I think it's called metal finishing with, with Prezzo, and uh, he covers anodizing and japanning and cold bluing and hot blacking and all kinds of stuff, and uh, he's really, really good at it, at that stuff. And it's something that I would love to be better at. It's, uh, you need a lot of chemicals and a lot of, you need an ultrasonic cleaner and you need hot and cold baths and you need a lot of exotic chemicals to do all these different things. Uh, so I just don't really have the facility uh, or space for all of that at the moment, but that is something I'd like to try. Uh, the other thing I'd like to try is foundry work. I would really like to do some casting of my own uh, flywheels and cylinders and things for engines, that kind of stuff. Um, so I may have space for that in my backyard. Uh, I've got an area that I could make a little sand pit and possibly do some, some casting out there. So maybe we'll see. Stay tuned. Uh, what boring bars do you like for your boring head? Uh, he mentions the, uh, brazed carbide ones that tend to come with those things like the, uh, the boring head kit from Little Machine Shop, which is the one that I have. And yeah, I do use those braced carbide boring bars in my boring head. They work fine. Uh, the trick is you have to get the angle on them right because you got to get that cutting edge on center. So that typically means you have to actually put a negative rake on that cutter in order to get it on center. So that's really the secret to getting good finishes with those things. Using a 7x16 mini mill, how can I get the best finish turning mild steel? Uh, well, first of all, uh, don't turn mild steel. Uh, <laughs> if by mild steel you mean 1018, 1018 is not a good machining steel. Uh, in fact, you know, in, in the machining world uh, of industry, uh, almost nothing uh, that is part of a uh, machining process is made from 1018. Pretty much everything is 4140 or uh, similar steels that machine well, uh, and that's part of why. So that's step one. Uh, use a free machining steel uh, like 12L14 or 1215 um, or 4140. Again, the size of the mill doesn't matter. The size of the mill only sets how fast you can cut and how deep of cut you can take, and thus how long the operation is going to take. I have two daughters who had no interest whatsoever in playing in my workshop growing up. Did your parents cultivate that or was it innate? Uh, I mean, kids are going to be who they are, right? They're their own people and they're not going to like the same stuff that we do. That's just how it is. Uh, encourage whatever interest your kids do have. And uh, I mean, I think that's, that's all we can really do. I, I mean, I spent much of my childhood on a farm and, you know, we just had to fix things and I was sort of drawn to that, I guess, because of that. Uh, but my sister uh, spent a comparable amount of time on the same farm and showed no interest in it. So you have to ask a psychologist, I guess. How much of your voiceovers are recorded live versus uh, dubbed? Most of my voiceover is done uh, in the studio during editing because uh, that gives me two things. It allows me to set the pacing and it allows me to edit in a way that makes a decent narrative because of course I often do things in the shop in a different order than you see them in the video uh, or I might have to do them more than once uh, so I want to be able to create uh, an interesting story out of the footage basically. What you see is what really happened but I have to tell it in a way that's compelling so uh, voiceover allows me to do that. Voiceover allows me also to control the audio quality. Uh, my shop is extremely difficult uh, from an audio standpoint. I've got reverb panels and I've done all the things that you do to get good audio in a given space, but I still have never succeeded in getting really good quality audio in there. And as you can see from my intros, the auto audio quality in my on-camera intros in my shop is always a lot worse and that's why. So uh, all those reasons I do my voiceover after the fact. If you were to replace your PM lathe, what would you replace it with? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess because I have this YouTube channel, people often expect me to be an expert on the small machine tool marketplace, and I'm really not. Like, I don't know anything about most brands of lathes. There are thousands of hobby-grade lathes out there, and I haven't used any of them. I don't know how good they all are. I don't know which ones are worth the money, which ones are, you know, which one a certain person should buy. Uh, so I guess I really don't know the answer to that question. If purchasing a mill and a lathe, what should be budgeted for necessary tooling? Uh, the rule of thumb for a lathe in particular is 50% of your budget should be saved for the tooling. I think that's pretty accurate. 
I think for a mill, it's even more. I, th I think I would budget probably 60% for tooling. Mills need a lot of tooling. They really do, like way more than the lathe, probably twice as much. Uh, the good news on that front, though, is that you can buy it gradually. So you can buy the lathe and just buy a little bit of tooling and then over time uh, accumulate what you need. But yeah, if I look back now, I've probably spent, uh, I've easily spent more than the price of my lathe and my mill on tooling. It's happened over the course of five or six years, but I definitely have. Where did you pick up your knowledge of mechanical design? Uh, well, not formally. I, my education is electrical engineering and computer science, but uh, I have mechanical engineer friends. I watch mechanical engineering YouTube channels. Uh, I read mechanically themed books. You know, you just sort of absorb it, I guess. Uh, I consume as much information in every field as I can just because it's always interesting. And uh, you pick this stuff up, I guess. But don't let me design your trailer hitch or your bridge because I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, do you still do car stuff? Uh, I do. Uh, well, actually, I should say I'm on pause with the car stuff. Uh, I don't really have space right now to work on a car. Um, I have some potential space. I have a shed in the back that I could potentially uh, build a car in. So I have thought about doing that. Uh, it would take a lot of effort to, to make that shed uh, habitable and uh, suitable for, for working on a car. Uh, but at the moment, uh, you know, the machine shop has taken over the space that I would have used for working on cars. And also, as I get older, I'm less inclined to do so. Working on cars is kind of a young person's game. Uh, you know, you're on your back, you're in the dirt, you're upside down under the dash, you're hunched over the engine bay for hours at, at a time. Uh, it's, it's hard on the body. And the older I get, uh, the less appealing that is. But if I had room and budget for a hoist, uh, I would definitely be interested. I, I watch a lot of car YouTube channels. I, I like Make It Custom and I like Half-Ass Customs. Uh, all of the Canadian uh, hot rodders, I watch most of them. And, you know, seeing what they can do, you know, with a hoist uh, it really kind of makes me want to get into that again. So, yeah, we'll see. Have you thought about a project involving machining and electronics knowledge combined? A little bit, yeah. I've been looking for ways to combine those things. I uh, Well, as of this recording's release, you will have seen the DC generator uh, video there where I built a voltage regulator. You know, that was a fun little way to, to introduce some electronics. Uh, I thought I might be able to do some more of that with pinball content on the channel. I've done a couple of pinball videos, but those really perform extremely poorly, honestly, in, on the metrics. So I probably won't be doing more pinball videos, but uh, that would also be a way that I could combine the two a little bit. Uh, we'll see. A few people have asked general questions around the topic of 3D printing hammer forming mandrels. Uh, that's not something I've done. I don't think it would work very well. I'm not going to say for sure because I haven't tried it, but uh, 3D printed parts just aren't very strong. Maybe if you print them with an extremely high infill, which would then take eight hours. But I mean, in eight hours, I can turn a piece of aluminum a thousand times. Like I can cut a piece of oak or aluminum for a hammer forming mandrel in a 50th of the time that my 3D printer would take to make something equally strong. The thing about hammer forms is that the, the edges have to be sharp and clean and they have to be strong because all of the forces right in the corners, right on the edges. And I've just never seen a, a PLA print that can handle those kinds of forces right on those corners. So I'm not going to say it can't be done. I'm not going to say nobody is doing it, uh, but uh, I, I just don't think it would work very well. And I mean, the tried and true methods of using oak or aluminum for it work extremely well. And uh, I don't know if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, that was a lot of questions. We'll see how many make it into the final edit. I know I've recorded a lot of footage here, uh, but hopefully your questions got answered here. And uh, well, if not, I'm sure there will be another one of these videos uh, before too long. So thank you very much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making all of this content possible, and I will see you next time.